So how many of you here played with bugs or slimy creatures as a kid? Yeah? OK. Me too. And uh, like my daughter, I was more interested in finding fish bait than actually fishing. But as an adult, the most you might come across these creatures is in your compost. When my son started school last year, he was asked, what do your parents do for a living? And he said, my dad plays with worms. <laughs> so there are many things that live undetected by us out in your backyard. This is my backyard. In the soil, in the compost. But out there is an animal species that lives to great success, and it's nearly invisible to us all. So what am I talking about? Worms. But not earthworms that you would use for fishing or you will find on the sidewalk after it rains. They're called nematodes, microscopic worm species that's barely visible to your eyes, and they're everywhere. It's been said that if you could eliminate all matter on the planet except for nematodes, you would still see a ghostly outline of the world because they're everywhere. Would you believe that playing with things from the compost could help stop brain diseases? What if there was a worm species that could stop you from getting sick? The worm that could do this is called Sanerobditis elegans, or C. elegans to its friends. It's very small, it's only one millimeter long when it's fully grown, and these are some worms in captivity crawling across a dish in the laboratory. So barely visible to your eyes, there's this army of tiny worms that researchers worldwide use to answer many big questions. Things like, how do cells develop into whole animals? How do cells die? They've even provided clues into how we age. And why would people use these worms? Well, there are many benefits. First, C. elegans has rudimentary features in common with humans. It has a nervous system, it has a reproductive system, it has muscle cells and intestine, things like that. They also have a really short, rapid life cycle, which means you can do experiments in a short amount of time, from a couple of days to a few weeks. You can also grow them in large numbers, which means you can use many animals over and over again in many experiments so you have confidence in your results. A cool feature of these animals is that they're transparent, which means with a microscope you can look directly inside living animals. Now, this transparency is very useful for color coding experiments where, with the right animals, you can look at individual tissues and cells in living, aging animals. Our worm experiments are inexpensive, and when you're done with them, you can put them in the freezer until you need them again. That's not something I'd recommend for other animals, like your pets, if you go on vacation. <laughs> it's not the same thing. So these animals are an important uh, component of your backyard ecosystem, but they've made important contributions to human health as well. So my laboratory here in Montreal at the CR Schum University de Montréal, we study a degenerative disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. It's also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and you may be familiar with it from the ice bucket challenge this past few summers. It's a pretty bad disease where otherwise healthy people are quickly struck down. What happens is a part of the nervous system that's required for movement begins to die, and with it, the patients. And it, it can happen fast, anywhere from a few months to a few years after diagnosis, and there's no cure. So what does this have to do with worms? Well, worms, like people, can get sick too, and maybe this can help you or your family. So what do worms do in nature? They, they work hard to find food and reproduce, and they're very good at it. But we wanted to give them a new job. So researchers using modern genetic technologies have discovered over a dozen genes that when there's a mutation in one of these genes will cause ALS. Now this is good because then they can study what these genes are doing normally and what goes wrong in ALS patients. So our approach is simple. Since a single mutation in one of these genes causes ALS, what happens if we take these human genes and put them into the worms? And we've done that. When we put ALS genes into worms, they get sick. This is not great for them, but it provides us with a very powerful research tool. So what does this look like? Well, here's a worm on a plate in the lab, minding its own business, until a student comes along and taps it on the head. Tap. And it moves away, because who likes being tapped on the head? I mean, <laughs> this, this is normal. But when you do this with one of the ALS worms, same experiment, tap, nothing happens. This animal's very sick. It's essentially paralyzed, and it can just barely move its head. So as a researcher, this sick worm is easy to see, and it's something we can work with. I mentioned before that in ALS, it's the neurons involved in movement, more specifically the motor neurons. These are the neurons that end up dying in, in patients. Is this what we see in our simple animal model? Well, they're transparent, so we can look. The red signals are the, are the worm's motor neurons. And if you wait long enough, it takes about a week, you will see that these neurons do begin to die. 
maybe in a way similar to what happens in ALS. So what are we trying to do here? We now essentially have a hospital full of sick worms, right? So maybe we can use them to find, for example, drugs to help ALS patients. So as you may appreciate, contemporary drug discovery is expensive, takes a long time. Billions of dollars, many years to bring a single drug to market. Even testing one molecule in a good model like a mouse takes a long time and it's expensive. Maybe we can use our worms as some sort of advanced scout system to find drugs and maybe find good drugs that have an increased chance of working down the road in patients. And we've done this. Using our ALS worms, we developed a rapid drug screening technique where we find drugs that make the worms healthy again. So how does this work? Well, I showed you before that worms like to crawl. They'll do it outside in the soil or in the lab on plates. But they can also swim. If you put them in a bath, they start moving like crazy. These are regular worms. I put them in a bath. And they're thrashing about very active, healthy worms. But when you make the ALS worms swim, they get tired very quickly and stop moving. Um, I realize this is a movie of worms not really moving. But if you look carefully, you can see that some of them are barely twitching. In any event, they're very sick and immobile. So compared to this, it's very easy to see or find drugs that make them better again. So these are the ALS worms, the same ones, treated with a drug, and they're moving like crazy. They're healthy, they're essentially been rescued. And this is the basis of the drug screening technique. We're looking for this, worms that move like crazy. So with this approach, we can now test many molecules in a short amount of time, and it's cheap. It costs $1 to know if any particular drug is worth investigating further as a potential therapeutic, All right? So we went ahead and did this, and with this approach, we screened thousands of drugs in our worms, and we found about 20 molecules that made them healthy again. It may be cool to cure worms, but this is not our goal. We want to help patients. But as you can imagine, no one is going to take advice from a worm doctor, right? <laughs> There's no way. So we have to be very sure of our results before we get anywhere near people. So this means we have to test these drugs in models closer to humans. So to do this, we asked colleagues for help. But where do you go from worms? Why not fish? So a local colleague has developed a fish model of ALS, specifically a zebrafish model. And they tested our group of molecules in their fish. And they found one compound, which was very potent. Now this is interesting, because this is a drug that's been around for a long time, and it's been used to treat things like schizophrenia. So we're happy about this, and this, we wanted to go on. So we're eager to test this drug in what's considered the gold standard animal model of ALS. It's a mouse model. So again, with a local colleague, they tested this drug, and it worked. So now we're very excited. This drug now works in three animal models. We know a lot about this compound, and that it's safe for humans. This meant there was a chance we could get it to humans in a clinical trial for ALS. So we attracted, we were lucky to get the attention of a clinical researcher here in Canada as well, and his team set up a small clinical trial to test this drug in ALS. And we waited, because as you may appreciate, doing this type of stuff in humans takes longer than playing with worms, right? <laughs> and it's a little stressful for everybody in the lab because you're waiting. What if it doesn't work? What if our, this drug only works in these small animal models? What if our models are wrong? But in science, when you find something interesting, it means very little if others can't replicate your work or find something similar in their laboratories. So you have to test it. Also, as you may appreciate, science is a collaborative effort. But it's also very competitive. What if another group publishes something similar to us before us? And you know, the careers of professors, students, postdoctoral fellows, they're all, they all lie in the balance. Being first is very important. But we were patient, and we waited. And after much excellent hard work, the results are promising. And now, a large countrywide clinical trial to test this drug in ALS will go ahead. So if you step back, it looks like we basically short-circuited the drug discovery system. We took a drug that we found in worms and moved it to a clinical trial in two years. And it didn't cost very much. So we'll wait and see. And even better is the fact that the results are promising. And we're now applying this approach to other diseases, things like Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So insights into human health can come from unlikely places, your backyard, uh, playing with things, taking risks. So this year, when my son started school and he was asked what his parents did for a living, he said, 
My dad makes worms sick, then he makes them better again. <laughs> and maybe one day this can be okay for people too. Thank you.